Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here uh, today, and of course, it's great to have our guests with us today as well. I just want to set the stage for our terrific program today. Uh, by way of reminder, I am Mike Gerhardt, the scholar in residence at the National Constitution Center. Um, and I want to uh, just make a few other announcements uh, so that you're aware of what's coming up. Uh, today is the last uh, discussion of our spring and summer town hall programs, but in the fall we have a number of great programs, including uh, religious liberty advocate Christina Ariaga, leading Civil War historian Ed Ayers, former Florida governor presidential and presidential candidate Jeb Bush, also um, journalist and former New, New Republic editor Franklin Four, and CBS's Face the Nation Bob Schieffer, esteemed historian David Blight, and others. So it's going to be a very busy fall. That's the nature of the Constitution. It's never uh, a dull moment. Um, <laughs> And we will announce our fall schedule in August, so please continue to check our website for updates at constitutioncenter.org slash debate. And really, without further ado, I want to introduce our wonderful speaker today, Sidney Blumenthal. He is a former assistant and senior advisor to President Bill Clinton and senior advisor to Hillary Clinton. He's been a national staff reporter uh, for the Washington Post, Washington editor and staff writer for The New Yorker, and senior writer for The New Republic and has contributed new, to numerous additional publications. He's the author of the first volume, of course, in this wonderful biography, A Self-Made Man. Um, and we will be talking about the second volume today, and there are other volumes to come. And um, of course, has been a great and wonderful and passionate and erudite thinker and commentator on the politics of our own age, though we'll be talking about a different one in a moment. And we're particularly thrilled to have him um, with us today. Sorry, of course, about our prior um, situation, and it's just, it was just a warm up. <laughs> we, we rarely get that chance to do it. So, Sydney, so we're thrilled to have you today. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. <clears throat> this is a terrific biography of Abraham Lincoln, and maybe a great place to begin is why Lincoln, what got you interested in Abraham Lincoln, and, and maybe even r tell us a little bit about what goes on the first volume that helps us set, set the stage for the second. Okay, well thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I'm delighted to be back here at the Constitution Center, which is um, a terrific institution. I'm glad to be here in Philadelphia, which is one of my favorite city, cities, not least because my wife is from Philadelphia. <laughs> and my son is a graduate of Penn. <laughs> so, so I'm glad to be here. That's great. Um, uh, I first uh, uh, became interested in Lincoln as a boy. Um, I grew up in uh, Illinois, in Chicago, uh, and Lincoln was still ubiquitous everywhere. His picture was in the classroom. And uh, when I was very young, I was taken on a pilgrimage to Springfield uh, by uh, an older cousin, uh, my grandmother's cousin, uh, who was traveling then. And um, it really helped awaken in me an interest in American history, American politics, uh, and Lincoln. Um, I think I was an unusual kid in wanting to have as presence Carl Sandburg's Lincoln. Hmm. So, uh, uh, and I've retained that uh, interest. Um, the first volume is called A Self-Made Man. It uh, uh, charts uh, Lincoln from his birth in extreme poverty um, uh, to uh, the end of his first term in Congress, which is where this picks up. Uh, he, uh, um, he jokes. Uh, in 1856, um, uh, after he's become a Republican, uh, and he's on the he's out campaigning for the Republican ticket then in the first mm -hmm. Republican campaign, um, uh, and he tells a crowd, "I used to be a slave," and it's half a joke, but it's not a joke, because he did think he was a slave. He was a slave. He felt to his father, mm -hmm. uh, Tom Lincoln 
who was a uh, poor dirt farmer, semi-literate. Uh, Lincoln was um, uh, embarrassed by his father's illiteracy, um, uh, said he could write only blunderingly. Um, in, uh, he, uh, his father did not want Lincoln to be educated, uh, would punish him for reading. Uh, it was Lincoln's uh, stepmother, uh, after his mother died, who protected him from his uh, father. Mm. Um, uh, uh, Tom Lincoln saw it as um, dreaminess and a form of laziness, and um, thought that Lincoln, his son, should learn a trade uh, and would otherwise fall by the wayside. Um, mm. He was rented out as an indentured servant until he was 21 years old. His father took all of his wages. Um, he felt he was a slave. Uh, his father had fled slavery from Kentucky, a slave state across the Ohio River and Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, he had been expropriated in an unfair lawsuit by a wealthy landowner. He had had to compete for wages against slaves. Um, and Lincoln in his uh, 1854 speech against the Kansas-Nebraska Act says that slave states are places for poor white people to, to leave and to escape from. And uh, so it's not simply fugitive slaves uh, who, who escape, it's in his sense white slaves. Mm -hmm. um, so Lincoln has this sensibility and um, he felt that, and he did, emancipate himself. Mm -hmm. And his whole personal struggle to raise himself up mm -hmm. from this background, uh, to turn himself into overcoming uh, every obstacle, uh, including um, uh, personal depression um, and uh, resolving and dealing and confronting um, those feelings, including suicidal impulses, uh, and turning himself into a respectable person, a lawyer, uh, creating a family, um, and uh, becoming a political leader, um, uh, uh, was uh, his own form of self-emancipation. Um, after his first term in Congress, he comes home, and he, is, he has failed to get a federal patronage mm -hmm. post in the Zachary Taylor Whig administration that's just been elected. Um, he has returned to his spare law office in Springfield on the second story of the Tinsley building in, in bustling downtown Springfield. <laughs> and uh, he is there with his law partner, William Henry Herndon. It's a large law office. The, there are two men staring at each other. <laughs> <laughs> and Lincoln stares off into the distance for long periods of time, and Herndon says he speaks gloomily, despairingly, and wonders, what's, what's the purpose? Well, why am I doing this? Um, what can anyone do? Politics is dead, um, and um, who can do anything? And this is... 1849, and that's where we find Lincoln at the beginning here. Yes, and in fact, this book covers all of seven years, um, but they are very important seven years for Lincoln, a very important seven years for the United States, um, and uh, we're gonna find out in a minute why those seven years justify really the close attention you've given them. So why does Lincoln leave Congress? Why does he go, come back to Springfield after his one term? Well, um, Lincoln only managed to get to Congress by um, creating the convention system in, the, uh, in Illinois, um, imitating uh, the Democrats. Stephen A. Douglas, his great rival, had cr actually created it in the state, as opposed to um, having the whole party or you know, convention, or, or rather elections, create, uh, name the candidate. It was more delegates from a convention. It was, it was, there was much more tight party control. Mm -hmm. And in, he controlled the convention that picked essentially three consecutive 
candidates for this congressional seat, which was the only reliable Whig congressional seat in the state of Illinois that was overwhelmingly a Jacksonian Democratic state, mm -hmm. of which Stephen A. Douglas was the leader of, of that party. And um, uh, Lincoln arranged it so that, that there would be first one person who, um, who then left to, uh, to go fight in the, it was actually a, a distant cousin of his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, mm -hmm. named uh, John Hardin, who went and joined up in the Mexican War and was killed in the war. Uh, he was a very attractive, uh, promising young man. Next one was a close friend of Lincoln, um, and it's Edward Baker. And um, he holds the seat. And then it's Lincoln's turn. And he arrives in uh, Washington. The war's over. Uh, and he gives speeches against the war. Um, the speeches de uh, demand to know where the war was started, uh, how James K. Polk, the Democratic president, had falsely initiated a war and uh, manipulated it and exploited it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's actually not very popular in the district for Lincoln to do that. <laughs> but, um, but Lincoln is playing, he's, he's, he's playing another game. Uh, we should always remember what Herndon says, that his ambition is a little engine that knows no rest. Um, and he has different objects over time. Right. And this object is he wants a Whig to be elected president. He wants to tarnish the incumbent Democratic president. And then when the Whig is, is elected, he wishes to get to become the, the person who controls the patronage in the state of Illinois. Right. And um, the, uh, Zachary Taylor, uh, general and hero of the Mexican War, is elected. But Lincoln is not rewarded. He's not rewarded. And then he's got to do some, and I'm a law professor, so it's hard for me to say this. So then he's got to practice law. <laughs> <laughs> not his first choice, necessarily. But you write about that in the book. And in fact, you begin the book with a very important case for Lincoln and his family particularly his wife's family. Um, and maybe to, it might be uh, interesting to know what, what this big case is all about to begin with. And then we'll uh, get to what happens after the case. But, but for Lincoln, he's, if he can't do politics, he's got to practice law. And of course, now he's got a, one of the big cases he's got involves his own family. Well, uh, this is a fascinating case. And it's a complicated case. and it, um, in my research and going through all the uh, memoirs and accounts and even uh, obscure pamphlets of the time, uh, one can piece together uh, mm -hmm. its tremendous influence on Lincoln and his thinking. And it's been largely overlooked. As soon as he, almost as soon as he returns to Springfield, his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, turns him around and says, you have to go to my hometown, Lexington, and recover my family fortune. And it's a large family fortune, the Todd family fortune. They're a wealthy family. Her father, John S. Todd, was Henry Clay's business partner and political ally. And she grew up knowing Clay very well. It's where she got the first idea as a nine-year-old that she should marry a president. <laughs> and, uh, but her father had died of cholera in 1849. He had been fighting to get control of the family fortune for years, engaged in a lengthy legal battle, something that Dickens might have written about in Bleak House, um, with a man named Robert Wycliffe. Now, Wycliffe is a uh, wealthy lawyer and slave owner. Now, uh, John S. Todd owns slaves, too. But uh, he's a clay Whig. He's for, you know, he, he has ideas about possible gradual emancipa compensated emancipation and so on and so forth. And Wycliffe 
represents this new virulent pro-slavery movement. And they want to change the state constitution of Kentucky. Kentucky had always thought of itself as different than other southern states. Um, and that it was, and this was in partly created by Clay. And they always thought that somehow slavery would be ended. It could be gradual, it could be compensated. And they kicked the can. They kept kicking the can. But there were laws against the slave trade uh, within the boundaries of the state of Kentucky. It was different from other southern states. And Wycliffe wanted to remove that law inhibiting the slave trade. It was called the Non-Importation mm -hmm. uh, Trade uh, Act. Rewrite the state constitution, sort of blast open the place to, to slavery. And why? Slavery is a powerful economic force. It's the most powerful economic mm -hmm. force in the country. Outside of all the real estate in the United States, the greatest value in the country is in the slaves themselves, in the in human property. Uh, and, and the entire um, uh, real estate system is built on it. Mortgages are built on slaves. Derivatives are created out of that. Um, the international financial system is built on slavery. The London uh, markets are built on it. Wall Street's created on it. State Street in Boston's created on it. Um, it's, uh, it's all, t it's, uh, the Industrial Revolution, the creation of the mills, all that is, subs you know, it's all built on slavery. So here's Wycliffe, he's part of this explosion, the very powerful movement, and Lincoln walks into the middle of this. <laughs> he's fighting, now why is he involved? He's involved because he's married a Todd cousin named Polly Todd, who has died. And he's inherited the Todd estate, and John Todd had tried to get it. So uh, here comes this case, Todd Ayers v. Wycliffe, and Lincoln loses the case. Um, Wycliffe gains the clear title to the Todd fortune, um, and then and there's more to it than that. And what there is more to it is that there actually is a rightful heir to Polly Todd's fortune, except he, has, he is not legally a person. He's a slave. He is her grandson. Her son, who had died relatively young, had had an affair with her housemaid, who was a slave and had a son. And she had, over time, educated this, this boy, emancipated him, and sent him and his mother and siblings to Liberia to colonize it. And he was gone. He's the rightful heir. Mm -hmm. But here's the kicker. He becomes the president of Liberia. <laughs> <laughs> so Mary Todd was related to two presidents. <laughs> very, very sharp woman. But, but what <laughs> happens is uh, you, Lincoln get, is, is radicalized by this experience. It's not simply that he's lost the money, uh, that, he, that the family's embittered. He sees firsthand the, the rise of this pro-slavery movement. He sees the whole uh, legacy of Henry Clay st uh, stamped uh, uh, down. Mm -hmm. He sees um, what's coming. And um, he understands that the old politics are gonna break apart, that he's gonna have to take a side but he only talks about it privately. He does not yet, he's not yet ready to talk publicly. And he recedes into the prairie and into his law practice, riding on old Bob the horse from county courthouse to county courthouse, pursuing these cases. But it's churning in his mind. It's churning in his mind, of course, as and, and this is one of the, I think, one of the not just great things about the book, but it's also um, 
something that's truly fascinating. As Lincoln is wrestling with his angel, as those things churn, of course, the world doesn't stop. There's a lot of other things happening, particularly in Washington. Um, and among them is Taylor then dies. And then we have a huge battle in Congress over what becomes known as the Compromise of 1850. So maybe we begin to shift our focus. As Lincoln is wrestling over here, let's think about what's happening in Washington and the nation's capital and elsewhere. Um, so tell us a little bit about some of those congressional debates, particularly as they may lead to the Compromise of 1850, and why they're going to be important for the future. That's all happening during this time period, of course. So these events may seem obscure, but actually they are going to create the circumstances that lead to Lincoln entering onto the stage of history. Uh, first, um, Zachary Taylor, who was thought of as having no politics whatsoever, a military hero, thought to be semi-literate, um, uh, runs on no platform whatsoever in 1848. No platform, no, no written platform for the Whig Party. And um, uh, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, the titans of the Congress uh, the, of the Whig Party, believe they will be the puppet masters of this uh, figurehead, and they will. But he turns out to have um, um, uh, ideas, and the idea is principally that the war that he has won and all the vast territories from what's called the Mexican Cession, all the all the that territory he believes should not be slave territory, except for Texas, of course. But he believes um, California and the vast west, it's called New Mexico, but New Mexico went all the way up to, to Utah. So um, uh, the Southern Whigs revolt against him, uh, and it appears as though there's going to be an incipient civil war, and he says, uh, if they're not going to follow what I'm going to say, I'll lead the army myself, and I'll put them down. There's a, a, a movement in Texas for a Texas army to take control of New Mexico, and Taylor's ready to put everyone down. Um, and uh, he opposes the Compromise of 1850 uh, because he sees that as giving way to creating more slave states and tipping the balance of power in the country to the South, strangely enough, for a Louisiana slaveholder. Uh, so he dies in the same cholera epidemic as John Todd. And um, he's removed from the scene very suddenly. Um, standing at his bedside is his son-in-law, who had married, who, whose first wife was Zachary Taylor's daughter, Senator Jefferson Davis. Um, Taylor is gone. Millard Fillmore is president. <laughs> but, uh, but more important, but what really, the real action's in the Congress. Right. And what's happening there, of course. So, so the, with Taylor as president, he's trying to stop the Compromise of 1850. He doesn't want to uh, approve anything like the Fugitive Slave Law or anything that will actually come to pass. But without him in the scene, and Fillmore being a relatively weak president, as you say, the actions in the Congress, it isn't just Jefferson Davis who emerges on stage now, but somebody else is going to emerge on stage who's going to be very important for the Compromise of 1850 and, of course, for the future of the country and Lincoln's future in particular. And that person is Stephen A. Douglas. Because Henry Clay, who is mythically given credit for the Compromise of 1850, actually physically and politically collapsed. Uh, and the whole bill was defeated. It, um, it, there, it, I wouldn't call it repeal and replace, but it, the whole thing <laughs> collapsed. The whole, the whole bill collapsed, and they didn't know what to do. But there was a uh, dynamic, young political leader uh, who was skillful, who had a sense of his own destiny and a vision of the country. And that person stepped forward, steps forward in the Senate. And he's in his 30s, Stephen A. Douglas, senator from Illinois. And he passes that bill one part after another by controlling the lobbies, 
the special interests, he pays people off, and he's got a greater idea even than the Compromise of 1850 uh, behind him, which is to pass the Illinois Central Railroad Act. Now we're talking. And uh, it's the first federally charted railroad, which runs from Chicago to Mobile. And um, his hometown and my hometown, right? Yes, <laughs> right between here. And, um, uh, in, and uh, that involves uh, the Illinois bond lobby, Wall Street, uh, the Texas bond lobby. I mean, everything's thrown into that. It's huge interest. And Douglas is um, a magician uh, of these vast interests and becomes very wealthy himself in the process. As it happens, he owns the lakefront land <laughs> on Lake Michigan that he sells to the Illinois Central for the right of way. Um, and uh, moves to Chicago, which suddenly explodes and becomes the railroad hub of the country. Uh, and, uh, and here is Douglas now, the most prominent young dynamic figure in the country. He runs for president in 1852. He's 37. He runs a miserable campaign. Um, he insults every single figure in his party. They all hate him, and they fear him because he is a party of one. He's, they all know he's out for himself. They, no one trusts Stephen A. Douglas, but he's incredibly dynamic and powerful. And he's got a lot of, his finger is in every pie. Yes. And, and so as we watch what's happening in Washington, and particularly the, the rise or largely the rise of Stephen Douglas, um, something else is falling apart, and that's the Whig Party. So uh, what's happening at that end, in a sense, as, a, as the Democratic Party, in a sense, although it's not unified, at least it's succeeding. But as it succeeds, the Whig Party falls apart, and that's going to, of course, have an impact on Lincoln as well. Well, we had a two-party system, but the two parties were the Democratic Party and the Whig Party. Um, there are no Whigs today, um, but this was the other party. This party completely disintegrated. Um, the Whig party was only able to sustain itself so long as, and this was, became true eventually for the Democrats as well, as slavery was uh, kept out as a national issue mm. and was considered to be a local issue. That's partly why there was um, so much vested political interest in creating the Compromise of 1850. It was to um, do for politics what the Compromise of 1820-21 did, which was to remove slavery as this um, uh, centrifugal force from politics. But there are other forces at work, too. And one of the most powerful is a new force in the country, immigration. And what happens is that the first great wave of immigration takes place after 1848 through the early 1850s. And there's a huge wave of Irish coming as a result of the potato famine and Germans as a result of the failed liberal democratic revolutions in Germany. And um, these will change our politics. One reaction is that is the rise of an anti-immigrant movement and political party called the Know Nothings, or the American Party, as they call themselves. And it has one platform plank, which is that only native-born Protestants can hold public office in the United States. That's the Know Nothing Party. It's a very powerful party. It appears to be on the rise. And a lot of Whigs join after they're defeated in a landslide in 1852. Um, and, and there are all kinds of movements running across the landscape. And, and the Whigs appear to be a hopeless uh, party. But then something even more important happens to blast them apart. And what is that? And that is the Kansas-Nebraska right. Act. Yeah, so the, so the Kansas-Nebraska Act, of course, does follow 
Um, and that follows in part because of the success of a candidate that we hadn't necessarily expected on the Democratic side, and that's Franklin Pierce. Pierce comes to office as president. His secretary of war is Jefferson Davis. Um, and actually, Pierce promises, among other things, not to undo the Missouri Compromise. Uh, the Missouri Compromise had kept slavery out of the territories. But he's now president. He's got to govern with the Democratic Party he's got. And one of the things that's coming up in Congress is going to be called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. So what, uh, tell us why that becomes a very important piece of legislation, not just in Washington, but of course it's going to be important for Lincoln as well. Well, the two people who Lincoln will spend the rest of his life contending with are people who are deeply involved in uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which tears apart the political and social contract and, and eventually destroys both political parties. And <laughs> these two individuals are Stephen A. Douglas and Jefferson Davis. Stephen A. Douglas wants to be president. He has already lost a campaign. He's not even 40 years old. Um, uh, and he has created the Illinois Central Railroad. Now he wants to create a transcontinental railroad. And he believes that that will be the vehicle that will carry him to the White House if he can create this. But there's a problem. He's got to, do, to go west. He's got to go through the territories. They're not states yet. They have to be organized. What are they going to be? Slave or free? What's the deal? There's a problem. The Missouri Compromise, that's the Compromise of 1820-21, says you can't have slavery above a certain line. It's a parallel line across the country north of it. So he's not going to get this approved by the Congress if under the Missouri Compromise. And uh, the Southerners would like very much to repeal it, because they'd like to open up the whole country to slavery and tilt the balance of power to the, to the South and the slave power. Mm -hmm. And um, they also have a, a vision of a transcontinental railroad. They'd like a southern route um, and think that that will um, solidify and expand slavery. Uh, Douglas thinks he'd like a central and northern route. He's also invested in Dubuque, Iowa, and <laughs> Superior <laughs> City, Wisconsin. Um, and uh, as the terminuses of different routes uh, to profit. And he's already bought in uh, uh, key members of the committees in the Congress and given them shares. Um, and um, they, they, uh, it's, a, uh, um, it's a complicated story, that, but they, uh, they reach a resolution and they repeal the Missouri Compromise. And um, politics explodes. The, um, the Southern Whigs break apart from the National Whig Party. Um, they support um, slavery. They want the extension of slavery. The nationalization of slavery, the extension of slavery, becomes the number one issue in the country. And Douglas has done this. He's done this through, a, through the art of the deal and through making deals with the power behind the throne, behind the weak Franklin Pierce, Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis, who has his own vision. And, um, and now um, the question is, can there be a new anti-slavery coalition? And in the meantime, you've got the Know Nothing Party. You have temperance movements, which are pretty uh, vital uh, politically. Um, you've got the Whig Party falling, completely falling apart now. You've got Southern Whigs drifting towards the Democrats. You've got Northern anti-slavery Democrats opposed to the Kansas-Nebraska Act who don't trust Northern anti-slavery Whigs. How do you put this all together? Well, one thing that's happened, though, is that Stephen A. Douglas, in his 
bid for power um, and his ruthless ambition has now removed the rock and out comes this prairie lawyer, his longtime rival, on the issue of the extension of slavery. So what, uh, one of the, again, one of the great things about this particular volume is that we are seeing some people emerge on this stage and obviously try and uh, write the national agenda, and Douglas is one of them. We're seeing other people leave the stage. So I just want to spend a moment or two on some of those others that are leaving the, the stage of national politics. For example, we have a question from the audience about Henry Clay, asking about your assessment of Clay and whom today you might compare him to contemporary politics. Clay had been an idol of Lincoln's. Lincoln had eulogized Clay. And as you pointed out, he was dying, or uh, essentially dying. He does eventually die when Fillmore's president. Um, and he's now revered as one of the greatest senators in, in the country. So uh, you, be curious about your assessment and, and Lincoln's assessment of Clay. Um, Lincoln had once said that Clay was his beau ideal of a statesman. Um, it was his model. Uh, Clay had first uh, coined the term self-made man. It was an image that Lincoln uh, came to inhabit. Um, he was a poor boy, and he had lifted himself up uh, in Kentucky, a border state. Um, uh, he had never embraced um, slavery, although he had slaves. Eventually, he emancipates them upon his death. Um, Clay uh, uh, always, uh, invented the role, the power of, of the House of Representatives. He invented the role of Speaker of the House. He was the, really the first powerful speaker. Um, he becomes a senator, and he's a, a, a quadrennial uh, presidential uh, candidate. He, he gains the nomination once in 1844, barely loses, barely loses. Um, sort of broken apart on the issue of Texas annexation and the expansion, the extension of slavery again. That, uh, and, um, uh, uh, it, and they're complicated local issues, but Clay becomes a figure who has been on the stage for decades. He's a master legislator. He's a great orator. Um, uh, he, ha he believes in the American system as he calls it, of building uh, the national economy and nation through an affirmative uh, role for the federal government, especially in, in building infrastructure. And at that time, that meant uh, clearing rivers and harbors and building canals, establishing the arteries of, of commerce that would bring the union together. He had a real vision about this. Lincoln really believed in this vision. Lincoln was, these, uh, the Whigs were pro-government men. Um, and they were generally pro-business, too. Uh, Clay carries a lot of burdens politically. He's been around a long time. He has baggage. And um, Lincoln, um, although he idolizes Clay, doesn't support him for president locally in Illinois in 1848 and supports Taylor. He wants you know, the hero to, to win. Lincoln wants to win. Right. And um, Lincoln doesn't support Clay again. Uh, so, and Lincoln's actually a little surprised. You write about this in the book. Lincoln's a little surprised when he finally meets Clay that Clay is not exactly exuberant to meet Lincoln. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, Lincoln's on his uh, way to uh, the Congress. He's been elected. He's, um, uh, and he comes to Lexington, which is, and John Todd's alive, and there's a meeting and a speech. Um, Clay delivers a, a, almost a eulogistic, self-eulogy. Um, his son had been killed in the Mexican War. He's, he's an older man now. He's, he's been, you know, uh, beaten by events. Mm -hmm. And um, he meets Lincoln, and he's not the man that Lincoln had hoped he would be in meeting him. And he's cool to Lincoln, who, after all, is nobody. Well, speaking of that, uh, we should get back to his law practice. Um, because 
as Lincoln, as events are unfolding or devolving in Washington with the Kansas Nebraska Act, Lincoln's still trying to practice law. And then he gets a case that he hopes might be one of his biggest cases. And, um, and of course, uh, this also gives him an opportunity to meet um, a great lawyer of the time, Edwin Stanton. Um, and this is going to be a pivotal moment as well for Lincoln. In a sense, it may be the bookend um, to his legal career, uh, beginning once he leaves Washington. Now he gets this big case. And what happens in this big case? Lincoln had been hired in what's called the Manny case. This is a case involving um, a patent of a reaper. And the, the, the contending forces are the Manny Corporation and the McCormick Reaper Company. Um, Lincoln had been originally hired as a lawyer uh, from Illinois because it, it had been thought that the case might be argued in Illinois, but it was not. <laughs> right. um, Lincoln was not told. Um, and he shows up in, um, I believe, in Ohio, uh, where it's being held. Uh, uh, the, um, in that time, Supreme Court justices traveled around the country and heard cases. Um, so there was a prominent Supreme Court justice named John McLean, who Lincoln admired. He was a, a, a powerful political person. Um, who was going to hear the case. And here's Lincoln, chance to argue before a Supreme Court justice, a prominent case, big case. Um, and uh, for its time, this is like high technology. Um, but they had hired the, mo the most uh, uh, sought after and qualified and influential corporate lawyer of his time. Edwin M. Stanton, who would later become Lincoln's Secretary of War. And Lincoln shows up, and Stanton takes one look at this um, provincial in an ill-fitting suit and says, um, he will never speak to the court. And Lincoln is humiliated. And he returns to Illinois, never being allowed to participate in the case. He watches it, and he realizes that he's not up to Stanton's standards as a lawyer in this sort of thing. And it's my view that Lincoln recognizes he's never going to be that kind of lawyer. Mm -hmm. And he knows where his real talent lies, and that's in politics. Yes, and so uh, and politics, of course, is going to be what then awaits him at the end of this volume. Um, but before we get there, I want to ask you about um, how you did this book. Uh, it was something, this is a question that came up uh, when last we had a chance to talk about it uh, here. It is a question from the audience, and the question basically is sort of how you did the research for this book, and particularly found some things that hadn't been found before um, it, it, that obviously deal with Lincoln's life. So how were you able to do that? Well, um, I, I, I think that uh, the internet has revolutionized scholarship. And um, what might, may have taken years now you know, is compressed. Because you can sit at your desk. And if you have a sense of what you're doing, you can find all sorts of things that were very difficult to find before. Whole university libraries have been put online, including um, arcane documents. Um, uh, I can, uh, yesterday, I'm writing volume three. I mean, I sat there and just, you know, uh, just read through the New York Tribune of 1856. Um, and you can just do that without moving. Uh, <laughs> And you don't have to go to a library and whirl through microfilm. Um, I, I'm lucky to live in Washington um, because um, there have been some, on some occasions, I've felt that I needed to go into the Library of Congress or the National Archives, and I can just go there. Uh, it's, it's not a big trip for me. 
and they're very helpful and you find yourself w really within minutes with these uh, handwritten documents in front of you. Um, I, uh, I try and read everybody's footnotes and drill down and then read everything in the footnotes and then drill down from there and then try and figure it out and put it together. Um, so there are, um, uh, there's uh, one passage uh, in uh, uh, Lincoln's eulogy of Clay in which he cites just a quotation, but um, uh, where to come from? Hmm. Um, but if you uh, now, I mean, it, it's it, it was so obscure, people, no one knew where it came from. But now that you can start googling and you drill down, it appears it's a quote from the New York Times of its day which is a quote reprinting a London newspaper and it's about slavery. And, it, um, act and actually it's, it's an argument with a Southern theologian who's arguing in favor of slavery as biblically sanctioned. And this is the beginning of Lincoln's theological argument with Southern pro-slavery theologians that would culminate in his second inaugural. So, um, so modern technology really has been helpful. So I, 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 I'm gonna take a, hopefully uh, some liberty with the title of your book. I assume that one of the things, of course, that gives rise to the title, the great title, Wrestling with His Angel, is that Lincoln's trying to form, figure out slavery, his own approach to it. Uh, so through this volume, um, where do we find Lincoln at, at the end, so to speak, in terms of um, his position on slavery? Yeah. Well, Lincoln always said, I, w I am, uh, he, Lincoln dictated two autobiographies when he ran for president in 1860. They're brief. And in one of them he says, um, I am naturally anti-slavery. And that's, that's, um, that's a more complicated thing mm -hmm. than it sounds because by naturally, he meant that uh, his parents were anti-slavery. They had belonged to uh, small anti-slavery churches in backwoods Kentucky, mm. very unusual churches. Um, mm. uh, and uh, Lincoln was always anti-slavery. And uh, he, when he first came to the state legislature, he was one of two Illinois state legislators who were willing to sign a statement declaring slavery unjust. Um, that was very unusual. Illinois was a very racist state. There was no Northern Illinois. There was no Chicago. Um, and um, so uh, when Lincoln was a congressman, he tried to create, he was a, considered to be a kind of you know, um, moderate Whig, but he voted for the Wilmot Proviso to ban slavery, prohibit slavery and the territories gained from the Mexican War. He always voted, for, he called himself a proviso man. And he tried to cobble together a compromise bill to, um, for emancipation in the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a very forward looking thing at the time. Um, the bill never got a single hearing in the House of Representatives. That was his greatest achievement in the House. Never got a single hearing. Um, <laughs> and uh, Lincoln begins in this period, uh, as Herndon says, uh, in despair. And he says, what is to be done? Who can do anything? And um, by the end, he has uh, delivered his longest speech uh, in uh, 1854 against Kansas and Nebraska, working out the constitutional, political, and moral dilemmas of slavery mm -hmm. that will be the basis of all of his politics that carries him to the presidency. Mm -hmm. And by the time um, he delivers his House Divided speech in 1858, running against Douglas for the Senate, he says, uh, you know, we need to know uh, whither we are going and where, and so on. He's figured it out. It's not what, is, what can be done. 
it's, we know where we're going. And he says, you know, uh, a house divided cannot stand. You know, it'll become all one thing or all the other. And um, the nationalization of slavery, the extension of slavery becomes his great cause. And it's the basis on which he um, creates the coalition overcoming uh, all these other forces, including the anti-immigrant forces that he abhors um, and builds uh, and uh, leads uh, uh, the Illinois Republican Party, this new force to take on this issue. And so we've got two more volumes. I don't want you to have to talk about either of them too much, but what, what should we expect will be in the third volume? What will be the, the focus of that? Well, we'll see the rise of Lincoln. Um, uh, he, from the founding of the Illinois Republican Party to uh, his uh, nom nomination as president, and then the secession crisis, uh, his election itself uh, triggers secession. Um, uh, the country divides. Uh, he leads the country in, um, in, the, in the, its greatest uh, crisis. And, mm -hmm. um, um, and then he has to uh, gain control of all of these contending forces, including uh, his military. Uh, his mil and the military leader is trying to undermine him at every turn and has the loyalty of the army. Uh, uh, George B. McClellan uh, from Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> and um, McClellan um, is deeply opposed to what Lincoln is about to do um, uh, eventually, and that is um, to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. And that is a very uh, controversial and um, in many places deeply unpopular act that um, McClellan and others seek to repeal. It's, it's interesting because, uh, uh, actually interesting for a lot of reasons, uh, we know there's a lot ahead for Lincoln, there's a lot ahead for the United States, and yet of course the focus of the book is on those years in which when Lincoln is in the wilderness, as you say. Um, and so it's particularly interesting to see how he is forming himself and evolving and becoming the person that he will become to face these extraordinary times. Um, you, I won't take any of the thunder away from your next volume, but perhaps as we sort of end our discussion today, I can't help but ask about a piece you wrote not too long ago in the LA Times about what Lincoln might think of the current president. <laughs> well, um, I, um, the first volume, <laughs> Self Made Man, includes a discussion of Lincoln's very first uh, formal speech. It was a speech when he, uh, uh, when he was 29 years old, it's 1838, and the speech is to the Springfield Lyceum for young men. And, um, uh, the speech is on the perpetuation of our political institutions. Hmm. And it's a speech about democracy. Um, uh, Lincoln warns, uh, uh, here's the backdrop particularly. Um, this occurred uh, within weeks of a trial ending and uh, that concluded, culminated uh, the, the um, the ordeal of the murder of Elijah Lovejoy in Illinois, in Alton, Illinois, an anti-slavery editor. He'd been killed by a mob that destroyed his printing press for printing anti-slavery articles. And um, uh, the popular opinion was that uh, Lovejoy had it coming. Um, that uh, um, he had inflamed people with these opinions, and that um, th uh, those who uh, uh, killed him um, uh, uh, were acting in a, a, almost in self-defense. And the trial of his murders 
uh, led to their acquittal. Uh, and so that's the context of Lincoln's speech. And he's, he delivers a speech against mob rule and for the rule of law and against destroying printing presses and attacking <coughs> editors and newspapers. And, um, and, he, and then he says, uh, in, in, in this sort of environment, where the rule of law is being broken down and our democratic rights are not being protected. He warns, this is the young Lincoln, that there could be somebody who seeks, and these are Lincoln's words, celebrity and fame, and doesn't believe in uh, the, the standards um, of democratic society um, and will only seek his own ambition above all else, and that the people have to join together and, as Lincoln says, intelligently oppose such a figure if he ever were to arise. And that's just volume one. <laughs> uh, and there's more in volume two, and we look forward to the next couple of volumes. Um, there's uh, so much uh, about Lincoln that uh, continues to fascinate us. Um, one last question from the audience is how your own knowledge of Lincoln, interest in Lincoln, might have informed your thinking when you were advising President Clinton. Well, I, um, uh, I was, uh, I actually uh, hung up, there, were, there are a lot of pictures of Lincoln in the White House and uh, paintings and so on. Um, I, um, uh, I put a photograph of Lincoln in the office I had in the West Wing. Um, and uh, President Clinton himself is a big Lincoln devotee and a big reader of, of Lincoln's works and biographies. Um, uh, and um, I think it's had, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think we can always learn all sorts of lessons um, um, from Lincoln, and I can point to any number of them. I think um, uh, one idea that um, President Clinton spoke about, of course, was One America. Um, and um, uh, the diversity of our country and the need to form a more perfect union on a just basis. Of course, um, you know, President Obama also felt that. So, um, uh, and he, of course, um, uh, was deeply influenced by Lincoln as well and read about Lincoln. So I think that uh, the influence of Lincoln uh, over time takes on different meanings. Uh, and that's partly why it's always important uh, for every generation to meet Lincoln on our ground. Uh, Lincoln said we must um, think anew and act anew, including uh, in thinking about Lincoln. Well, there's, the good news for us is that there's more to come. Um, Sidney's going to be downstairs signing copies of his book. One of the great things about the National Constitution Center is we get to have really wonderful conversations and opportunities to think deeply about the people and events that have shaped the American Constitution, none more so than Abraham Lincoln, and none have done better than Sidney in bringing that back to life. So I want to thank him for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank great you pleasure. so much. Thank you.